Good evening. In the summer of 1986, there was a standoff between India and China in Arunachal Pradesh over Samudrong Chu. It lasted not for weeks, but for months. There are famous images of the then Army Chief, General Sundarji, the legendary General Sundarji, flying out almost two brigades full of men in what was then called Operation Falcon. There was an eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball confrontation with the Chinese till the following summer. Something similar is happening now in Dokola. This standoff between Indian and Chinese troops is likely to last many weeks, if not months. Today, China climbed up one more rung in the escalation ladder by saying there will be no meeting between Narendra Modi and Xi Jinping on the sidelines of the G20 in Hamburg. India says it never asked for such a meeting in the first place. How will this situation get resolved? The face-off in Dokola is our face-off tonight. China says there will be no meeting between Narendra Modi and Xi Jinping on the sidelines of the G20. India says we, need, we never asked for it. It was actually the Chinese who had first, first asked. The diplomatic standoff is Indian and Chinese troops face off at Doklam. China unleashes more war rhetoric against India. So how should India respond? Meet fire with fire or should cooler heads prevail? We'll be putting those questions to Funchuk Stobdan former ambassador and an expert on inner Asia affairs. Sushant Sareen, strategic affairs analyst. Lieutenant General B.S. Jaswal, retired former army commander of the Northern Command. Priyanka Chaturvedi of the Congress, Shazia Ilmi of the BJP and will also be joined from Beijing via Skype by senior journalist KJM Varma of the Press Trust of India. How should India respond to China's dare and this virtual daily escalation that the Chinese are doing both through their official spokespersons as well as through state media. You can vote for the best debater of the night. Go to our Twitter page. It's the pinned tweet. Take the poll and we'll have the final results at the end of the show. While that's our big focus, we'll get to our debate in just a couple of minutes. Here are the other headlines that we're tracking this Thursday evening on Face Off. One person is dead in mob violence in Bashir Hat in West Bengal, but the politics persists. BJP and TMC face off in the riot hit area while the state government rejects four companies of paramilitary forces that were dispatched by the centre. The centre and state governments face off over Hindi signages in Bengaluru's Namma Metro after the Kannada Development Authority reveals it was the central government that had asked for the Hindi signboards. Vandals run amok and deface English boards in the Ecotech Park. This is a CNN News 18 impact after we exposed how Class A drugs are being supplied to school kids in Telangana. The State Human Rights Commission intervenes. It demands answers from the local authorities. Liquor Baron and fugitive from Indian law, Vijay Malia appears in court for the hearing in his extradition case. He dares the Indian government to prove the charges against him. But up first, the fight over Doklam is now the longest standoff between India and China since the 1962 war. From a face-off between two armies, the fight has now moved to the diplomatic realm, where China now says that the atmosphere is not right for talks on the sidelines of the G20 summit in Hamburg. But India says, we never asked for those talks in the first place. On the contrary, it was the Chinese side that had initially sought such a meeting. India is refusing to bow down to China's threats, be it via statements or actually at the line of actual control. The communist regime, though, has unleashed a scathing propaganda war against India, claiming that the country is actually an aggressor against Himalayan nations. So what should the Modi government strategy be? Fight fire with fire or a calm, pragmatic approach? The standoff between Indian and Chinese troops at the Doklam Plateau is now officially the longest between both countries since the 1962 war. India refuses to back down and withdraw its troops. China now says there will be no meeting between Xi Jinping and Prime Minister Modi on the sidelines of the G20 summit in Hamburg. India says we never asked for one in the first place. The aim of this incident under the pretext of the so-called security concerns and protecting Bhutan is to flagrantly overstep the defined mutually recognized 1890 convention. China claims that Doklam is their territory, accusing India of encroaching on sovereign land. Chinese state media has also said that the regime will be forced to resolve the issue the military way. 
There is a clear strategic shift in China's view of Doklam, moving to a more aggressive position, even as India boosts its strategic ties with other world powers. In 2005, China formally accepted that Sikkim was part of India. This came after India in 2003 accepted that Tibet is a part of China when Vajpayee visited Beijing. Last month, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi said that Sikkim was an integral part of India. But on the 5th of July, Chinese state media said the communist regime could support independence for Sikkim, adding that India had deposed the king of Sikkim in 1975 and manipulated its parliament to annex the territory. For a nation that now cries sovereignty, China is aggressively pushing its One Belt, One Road initiative through sovereign Indian territory, unleashing its propaganda machine to claim the moral high ground. India boycotted the One Belt, One Road forum in Beijing back in May, which has been taken as a personal insult to Chinese President Xi Jinping. I don't understand why the building of a road by China in China's territory can bring serious risk to India. China builds roads on its own territory. This is a justified action by a sovereign state. The concern for India is how to defend security and strategic concerns while being on the sovereign land of one of its closest allies and friends, Bhutan. As China climbs up another rung in the escalation ladder, how should the Modi government respond? Match fire with fire or should cooler heads prevail? That's the big debate on Face Off at 9. So how should India respond to this deliberate and virtually daily upping of the ante by the Chinese? Joining us on our Talking Point panel tonight, Funchuk Stobdan is former ambassador and expert on inner Asian affairs, Sushant Sareen, strategic affairs analyst, Lieutenant General B.S. Jaswal is former army commander of the Northern Command, Priyanka Chaturvedi, spokesperson of the Congress, Shazi Elmi, spokesperson of the BJP, and we're joined via Skype from Beijing by senior journalist KJM Verma of the Press Trust of India. I'll start with you, Shazia. You know, the Chinese have been raising the rhetoric virtually on a daily basis, uh, they've been sort of climbing up the escalation ladder. The war rhetoric is getting sharper by the day. India, though, doesn't seem to be responding to it. Uh, sh isn't this giving the impression that India is scared to take on China? No, well, that is not entirely true. You see what is happening at uh, Dukulam is at, at the tri-junction, which is of great uh, geopolitical importance, considering the fact that it's a tri-junction between the, amongst the three countries, now, you just see how Bhutan is being dragged by China with this uh, uh, obtrusive construction activity, which India is fighting off, which is, by, which is why they've been engaged in this standoff. And uh, there has been a, no let off on that. So India is standing firm and would not want China in any way to uh, re reinstate its own idea, its own definition of what is the point no, but Shazia, uh, if you look at the uh, daily uh, statements, uh, if you no, no, one second, if you look at the daily, no, no, hang on, hang on, one second, if you look at the daily statements that are coming in from Beijing, no, no, one sec, one sec, you're not answering my question. The the daily statements that are coming in from Beijing, India is not responding to it. No, no, India is not responding. There's only one statement that has been put out. Hang on, Shazia, let me finish my question. Let me finish my question. Shazi, let me finish my question. Yeah, finish there, there, are, there are daily statements coming in from the foreign ministry spokesperson, no less than the foreign ministry spokesperson in that's Beijing. Right. And right. we have put out only one statement by the EMEA. That's the only statement by the government of India in all of the so last two weeks. Why is it that India is not wanting to correct okay. the, the, some, of the, some of the frankly erroneous things that the Chinese are saying? So, so well, actions do speak louder than words especially where this issue is concerned, you just see overall in the scheme of things. You look at the Belt Road Initiative, which is one Belt, one Road, how India has raised objections. You see how India has opposed the whole China-Pakistan uh, um, economic corridor, CTEC matter. You also see that in Bhutan is being dragged into it and it's, it's, uh, how, China, how radical China is because India's troops are not, uh, are, are not withdrawing. Okay. It's pushing let, let me get Priyanka Chaturvedi to respond to that. If we have her, do we have her line? All right, we don't have her line, but we'll get to that. Okay, we'll get to Priyanka in just one second. But let me get Lieutenant General Jaswal to respond. How should India respond to this daily escalation by uh, by the Chinese? Uh, uh, Shazia says, you know, it's it's the mature response not to match the Chinese rhetoric for rhetoric. But the fact is, today, for example, the Chinese put out 
a, a soundbite of the political counselor here in the embassy in Delhi on YouTube. And the irony is not lost on folks because YouTube is banned in China. Uh, can I play out a 30 second bite of what uh, the political counselor of the, uh, of the Chinese embassy here in Delhi had to say? His name is Li Yan. This, of course, is Chinese propaganda. This is on YouTube. It was put out earlier this morning. And then I'll get Lieutenant General Jaswal on how India should respond to this propaganda machine that seems to have been unleashed on the Doklam standoff. The India's position are groundless. As to who Doklam belongs to Bhutan, we have strong evidence to prove that Doklam belongs to China. The Indian border troops pull back to the Indian side of the boundary unconditionally and immediately. This is the precondition for any meaningful dialogue between China and India. I mean, not only are they upping the rhetoric, they're also laying preconditions for any dialogue. Lieutenant General Jaswal, how should India respond? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, the way we have been responding to the rhetorics, uh, I think uh, it's a very mature way. We cannot get on for tit for tat kind of a thing with them. The defense minister has given a very strong message when he said it is no more 1962. I think that itself is a very, very strong message and it sums up the whole thing. Now, we must understand that it is uh, innate in the Chinese uh, policy, creeping assertiveness. They have timelines for that. That's how they went into uh, some Drangchu, Namkachu, Wangdong yeah. incident which took place. Other areas too, it is asserting itself. This was a timeline up to 2012. And thereafter, it was the course of strategy wherein they were to carry on diplomatic isolation of the country. Mm -hmm. Now, that they have already with String of Pearls, uh, now Djibouti, etc., etc., uh, you know, Gwadar. So, they are trying to diplomatically isolate. But this creeping assertiveness, it gets merged in with the course of strategy. So, China will keep doing this. Okay. It is doing transgression. Over here also, as a matter of fact, what they are saying it's a difference of perception. Mm -hmm. The actual, actual line which is there, as per our contention, is from Batangla to Senchenla. Whereas he claims that the land is up to Gemotion. Okay. L let now, me... There, there's a wide perception difference, difference. You know, differential in this. Let... So that's the reason they're coming. And uh, I think we, we cannot get into uh, war mongering uh, against L China. Let me also get it's in. Not let me right. It's a very mature Fair enough. Way. Let, let me also let get in Priyanka Chaturvedi, Ambassador Stoke Dan, Sushant Sareen. They're all waiting by. Uh, so is KJM Varma. Uh, uh, Priyanka Chaturvedi, th there was a very strong sort of editorial that was written in today's Global Times, which is considered an official mouthpiece for the Chinese Foreign Ministry, whereby they're even advocating a rethink of what India thought was a settled issue, and that is the boundary between Sikkim uh, and Tibet. And this is what the Global Times editorial says. Maybe Beijing should reconsider its stand over the Sikkim issue. Although China recognized India's annexation of Sikkim in 2003, it can readjust its stand on the matter. There are those in Sikkim who cherish their history as a separate state. They're sensitive to how the outside world views the Sikkim issue. As long as there are voices in Chinese society supporting Sikkim's independence, these voices will spread and fuel pro-independence appeals in Sikkim. This is an open call incitement to violence. Shouldn't India resist this? Shouldn't India respond to this? No, while India needs to respond, India needs to have its priorities very clear as to, uh, you know, when they can be aggressive, we can be assertive. And assertive can only happen when our own army, we are seeing that our army has taken a stance and they are not backing off. So it now becomes the, uh, I think, uh, responsibility of the government of the day to ensure that uh, there is de-escalation. De-escalation can only happen when we uh, start negotiation on something like this. While we very categorically say that boundary lines are not negotiable and our stance as far as Bhutan is concerned is again not negotiable. And this is something that an aggressive China needs to understand that they are dealing with an assertive India, an India which knows what, where bound, its boundaries are, what its strengths are. So this is something that we need to do and uh, very categorically uh, needs to be told to them in no so uncertain terms. Whether we should uh, have a same aggressive approach in terms of uh, writing editorials, etc., I think it would do more with Sh ha starting Sh a... Shazia, to respond.
but them because, because, we also need because to the remember. Chinese have already put a precondition on those talks. The Chinese are saying the only way that there are going to be any talks is if India so uh, unilaterally be, withdraws. This, this would definitely. So one second, what yeah. we need to do? So this ha only happens so because we. Uh, I think. Okay. Should I answer that? Yeah. yeah, so yeah. No, uh, Shazia yeah. first. Yeah, Shazia, go so, first. Yeah. So, so some, some some few points that I wish to make. One and most importantly, as I was uh, earlier uh, saying, and I didn't get time to, uh, Mr. Gately has very categorically and ambiguously asserted India's position and said that this is not the same India of 1952, okay. the India that was 2017. Two, that the to be G20 summit. Now, China is there is something happening there. You see, overall in the scheme of things, whether it's uh, Belt Road Initiative, the new Silk Route that they talk about, whether it's an undeclared string of pearl strategy, you just see how India has been resisting by partnering with Japan, by the Blue Ocean Strategy. You just see the resistance to uh, CPEC, which is China Pakistan Economic Corridor, that we cannot accept at all because the road is built to POK. So, and now, now we have got to know that there was no meeting scheduled between President Xi and Narendra Modi yeah. in Hamburg. So that is some thin doctrine happening at, at the end. So that just shows that the growing influence of India after the Modi, uh, uh, Trump, uh, Modi's visit and uh, the Trump's, uh, you know, the, the new warmth in the relations and India's visit to Israel. Let, let me get, let, let, let me get uh, KJM Varma. He, he was I, there at I the press conference today in, in Beijing. Where, where, what, what was this confusion, Mr. Varma? Because the Chinese foreign ministry spokesperson seemed to give the impression that, you know, the, the, there was a possibility of a meeting. That meeting now stands cancelled because uh, of the current atmosphere not being right. Uh, right after that statement, the Indian MEA is saying that no such meeting was sought for in the first place. What, what was the confusion uh, around this? Well, I, the, the, the fact is, I think uh, they have taken a decision that uh, uh, definitely they wouldn't like to have an open meeting. Uh, because, of course, we all know that uh, Mr. Xi Jinping in the next few months is heading for uh, his uh, next term. Uh, there is a big party congress coming up. I think uh, if you look at uh, in the last few years, be that South China Sea or be that of uh, Japan in the East China Sea, the disputed islands, and now, of course, uh, the India, or when, this, when it comes to sovereignty issues, I think that under Xi Jinping, there's a very vocal uh, stance being taken by uh, the Chinese government and sounds very nationalistic. Mm. So it, it is to be seen how well it goes down, especially in the people, probably. Uh, this is in the run-up. Let's not forget that. Yes, BRI, BRF and all are there. The Belt and Road Initiatives, we had a problem. Uh, uh, but I think the next big thing for Mr. Xi Jinping we'll be looking at is that, you know, he is to have this party congress where he is going to assume far more bigger powers okay. for the next five years. Let, and let, even he's, he's, he's even looking beyond. I, I want to co come back to this whole Sikkim thing because this is the first time, and I want to get Ambassador Stobdan and Sushant Sareen to weigh in on this. This is the first time that uh, there is an open sort of call by uh, a, 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 a mouthpiece of the, of the Chinese foreign ministry asking for a rethink on their stand in, on Sikkim on an issue that, frankly, India thought was well settled between both sides. But the Chinese have been very shifty, Ambassador Stobdan, about their uh, position on Sikkim. In 2005, when Wen Jiabao had come to India, and which is when the, the famous agreement on the guiding principles were agreed to between India and China, China had formally accepted that Sikkim is a part of India. This was in 2005. As recently as June of this year, the Chinese foreign minister, Wang Yi, had said that Sikkim is an integral part of India. But on the 5th of July, in this, in this editorial that was first put out by Global Times, China says uh, it could support possibly uh, a, a revival call for independence in Sikkim. It says that uh, India had deposed the king of Sikkim in 1975 and that India had manipulated Sikkim's parliament to annex territory. I mean, this editorial, Ambassador Stobdan, is, is basically an incitement, a, a call to violence, and, and somehow we're not seeing an adequate enough response from the Indian Foreign Ministry. No, not only they said that the uh, Sikkim issue will be revisited, they also said in the same editorial that they know enough about what's happening within Sikkim, that there are enough people within Sikkim who are talking about 
rethinking about the merger of Sikkim in the Indian Union. Mm -hmm. uh, this was part of the editorial. Mm -hmm. Now, if you recall, in 2005, as you rightly said, the Venjao Bao accepted Sikkim to be integral part of India, and he also offered a map. He presented a map showing Sikkim as a part of India. Yeah. Now, this came only after 2003, when Prime Minister Vajpayee visited China mm. and accepted Tibetan Autonomous Region, which is T-A-R, as an integral part of China. Now, mind you, from the Chinese definition, T-A-R also includes Arunachal Pradesh. And uh, since then, whether we understood or not, whether we uh, factored that uh, into our mind, but we accepted Tibetan Autonomous Region as part of China, and Tibetan Autonomous Region of part, if you look at the Chinese map, it shows Arunachal is part of T-A-R. Okay. Now, whether we have stuck to our position or we also try to provoke China in Arunachal Pradesh by sending Dalai Lama again and again, which is, as uh, I mean, uh, if we have control Arunachal Pradesh, we control Arunachal Pradesh. And why was the need to instigate China by sending Dalai Lama? How does it strengthen our position on Arunachal Pradesh? I, I could not understand. So the purpose is now they want to open up all the other fronts. Uh, not just uh, Arunachal or Bhutan or Sikkim and today, tomorrow it could be Ladakh also because uh, Dalai Lama is sitting in Ladakh for 48 uh, days now and they could make a case uh, out of that also okay. and I'm sure uh, this is a, and we haven't understood the Himalayan politics, the Himalayan entire issue uh, properly, there are fundamental flaws in our thinking and unless we clear up our own mind uh, today, things will become only complicated. T today, incidentally, happens yes. to be the and 82nd birthday of the Dalai Lama. But, but Sushant Sareen, you want to respond to what Ambassador Stobdan said? Was it a mistake? It was not just, you know, the Dalai Lama going on a six-day official visit to the Northeast, going all the way up to Tawang. It was also the former American ambassador, Richard Varma, who was allowed to go all the way up to Tawang. Ambassador Stobdan feels this was trying to needlessly, for want of a better word, poke the Chinese. Well, the Chinese also got poked when the Indian Prime Minister went to Arunachal. Uh, That's so true. what's about the Chinese? Uh, they are obviously uh, trying to, you know, uh, shove a finger in India's eye uh, and in other parts of our anatomy uh, at, at, at their own free will. So I don't agree with Ambassador Stobdhan on this particular issue. It's not just about uh, this particular, uh, the Dalai Lama's visit. Uh, we consider him to be a religious leader and frankly, I think this idiot who wrote the Global Time editorial, if it's the Chinese foreign ministry, uh, Zakas, quite frankly, you know, we had been, uh, we have built this image that the Chinese think very far ahead, that they're very wise people, everything is a very calculated move. But the way they have behaved on this particular standoff, they appear to me as petty, which is why they stop something as innocuous as a pilgrimage. They appear to be petulant the way they have been reacting on this whole issue of diplomacy and they appear to be puerile the way, you know, the kind of editorials they are publishing. Look for example, now if they are going to reopen, say for example, the issue of uh, Sikkim, uh, then what stops India from uh, reopening the issue of Tibet or Taiwan or any other place or Xinjiang? Yeah. Uh, the Chinese claim over these territories is also just as tenuous as if they want to make India's claim to be tenuous. Mm. So they are behaving in a very stupid manner. The other thing is that the Chinese should understand that India has shown great restraint, great strategic restraint that despite all the Chinese needling over so many years, you know, India has refrained from uh, getting into any kind of an alliance arrangement uh, with countries like Japan, with the US, with many of the other places. Uh, we, we have built up our relationship okay. with them, but you know, we've, we've not entered into an anti-Chinese kind of an alliance. But if this is the, going to be the attitude of the Chinese, and let's face it, uh, number one, that incentive uh, or disincentive will no longer be there for us. What? And number two, uh, in, over the last couple of years, when have the Chinese behaved in a very friendly manner on issues of India's concern? So I okay. think the Chinese, what, one of the things, mature and they want to one play of the a things the global state, that has been irking India, uh, that has been irking India for a, a, a good couple of years now, is this one belt, one road, and particularly the China-Pakistan economic corridor, which passes through a legitimate Indian territory, uh, uh, Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. Isn't it a bit rich, Lieutenant General Jaswal? 
when the Chinese now after this whole Doklam uh, incident are saying that that is legitimate sovereign Chinese territory and India is intruded into Chinese territory and this whole uh, blow up has happened for the better part of four weeks now whereas India for the last more than one year has been saying that look CPEC is going through uh, disputed territory this is sovereign Indian territory please take into take on board our concerns on sovereignty so I mean the Chinese can't uh, hold up a relationship on the basis of what they feel is an infringement of their sovereignty and kick out the window India's genuine concerns on our sovereignty vis-a-vis -vis CPEC. Yeah, very much as a matter of fact if you look into the CPEC history I think uh, you know the Chinese they have a perspective if you go back when Musharraf uh, and uh, uh, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh they almost agreed to convert the LC into IB there is a deep thought in the mind of Musharraf we almost converted it had we converted it we would have lost the right to question CPEC and that's the reason we should not go in. So they, the Chinese keep thinking ahead, as a matter of fact, and they have timelines. Are talking about the CPEC, uh, well, it's okay. Uh, we are claiming uh, what they call our right on it. What about Shakshkan? Have we yeah. ever tried to claim that 5,800 uh, uh, kilometers? We have never raised the voice. So there is a certain amount of, uh, I would say, eclipse in our thought process of countering Chinese as for territorial gains are concerned. Okay. We have not spoken about the Wangdong incident after that. Now, uh, this particular area, now the Doklam area, it's again a matter of perception, like I said. There's 89 square kilometers of Doklam. The Chinese, they look deep by coming into the Doklam plateau and the Dolam plateau, generally known, it's got a lot of ramification as far as India's strategic defense is concerned That's in true. Sikkim. Hmm. The Jal Dhaka, you see, they have claimed it up to uh, uh, Gemeshen. And from there, the Jal Dhaka River flows down. That goes straight to the plains, outflanking the entire uh, flank of the armed, uh, you know, deployment, uh, whatever uh, deployment we have. I don't want to name the divisions. They're deployed over there. So entire army, our flank is exposed. He goes through that. So Chinese will keep doing. They have a perspective. They will creep into it. They will create a situation. And you must go, you must go through the white paper on defense policy which was released in 2006. It said first, make China strong up to, uh, lay strong foundations up to 2010. Make China strong by 2020 and by mid 21st century fight peripheral wars. The only saving grace in that was try and avoid war, uh, local conflicts through diplomacy. So okay. China, you can expect them to do these kind of things. Let me, it knows that it is not in the interest of India let, let to me counter get, them in a kinetic manner. Okay, let, let me get, let me get uh, KJM Verma because I think we have him for just a few more minutes. Uh, you know, o over the last few years, the, the islands dispute that China has had with Japan or the numerous islands disputes that the Chinese have had with uh, ASEAN countries, over the last three, four years, through diplomatic means, military means, and certainly through propaganda means, the Chinese have sort of altered the reality of what used to be the dispute between Japan and China. For example, you know, it was always, it was always well understood that the uh, Diaoyu or the Senkaku Islands dispute, Japan had operational control. Yes, it was a dispute and China kept quiet about it. But now, in 2017, uh, the, the Japanese are actually playing catch up with the Chinese, militarily, diplomatically, and in this propaganda war. Could this be, what we're seeing in Doklam, could this be potentially the beginning of the Chinese attempting to do the same uh, maneuvers, operate from the same playbook, which seemed very successful for them vis-a-vis -vis Japan, now bring that same playbook vis-a-vis -vis India and Bhutan? Perhaps they may would like to try, but I think uh, they all know that there is a qualitative difference uh, in when it comes to uh, India and Japan. Japan is a very small nation. It has its uh, problem of population uh, uh, receding problems. And then, of course, it didn't have an active army, though they have a self-defense force. 
then of course they are under probably protection of us and all but in, it, in when it comes to india it is actually equally as big a population as china and uh, it's a huge country by itself we have also got a, a, a military that is well tested well trained and well fought uh, wars in dif on different fronts uh, it's uh, it's not uh, the same game or it's not the same terrain uh, that what of course chinese expects to do but they would like to try perhaps that uh, because that was a very successful campaign what they have done i think uh, probably barring highlighting our stand uh, probably india has done well in 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 terms of uh, trying to keep uh, its uh, rather uh, you know horses together in the sense that you know the more we speak on these issues the more you get into this global time kind kind of a rhetoric certain things have been answered i'm i'm happy to see the ruling party uh, politicians uh, yesterday i heard mr ram ramathau in your program and today i think the spokesperson of the bjp has come it's time that india has to outline its its stand more vocally what exactly we stand for in doklan i think that is probably good enough uh, probably for to to convince the uh, to the world that probably or probably to call chinese china's bluff on that okay. whatever but we need to we need to be more vocal in highlighting our stand without getting into rhetoric all right let, let me go go back uh, to the political panelists uh, shazia elmi and to and to priyanka chaturvedi uh you know just exactly a month ago if, if shazia is there we had the meeting between the two okay we've lost shazia let let priyanka take this question just a month ago priyanka we had the meeting between uh, narendra modi and xi jinping in astana a very cordial bilateral we were all told how how have things come to such a pass that in a month today we have this whole you know for want of a better phrase a tutu meme going on with the chinese foreign ministry spokesperson coming out and saying uh, no such meeting will happen giving the impression that india had actually asked for such a meeting in the first place then the indian uh, foreign ministry saying we never asked for such a meeting in the first place it was actually the chinese who had made that request first how have things spiraled out so badly that in the space of a month uh, in in two different summits it seems like the two principals the two leaders uh, don't want to sit across the table for a for a dialogue so there it also has to do a lot with perception that uh, china would want to present to its people back home and what india is planning to do back home unfortunately we see a lack of political will we do not see them like someone before me was saying that we need to be more vocal we need to be more assertive we haven't seen that happening i was very surprised when mr sareen said they are behaving in a juvenile petty uh, stupid manner but we must understand that is how chinese have behaved all along whether it was denying us our nsg membership whether it was denying us uh, you know giving masood azhar the terrorist uh, status that we were seeking from the united nations so this is par for the cause but it is uh, about the political will of uh, you know being vocal enough about where you stand and i would want to recall in 1967 we had a similar uh, eye to eye uh, combat with uh, china on this particular issue and the then prime minister mrs indira gandhi had called a press conference and told her about the uh, told the people about her commitment to with with bhutan to protect them at all cost and uh, how committed india was to ensure that uh, stability is maintained in the region including bhutan okay. so this is what is needed when we are when we when we speak about confidence we speak about having worked on our foreign policy having got many uh, our prime minister having visited many countries then i think it is time to build a coalition of countries that can ask china to also back off but what we I cannot do right now is exactly that simply because most of the countries are aligned with china as far as one belt one road is concerned so this is a serious cause of concern let me get Am ambassador stoped down i think wants to respond how we going to take this forward Am ambassador stoped down mm. you i think you, no. you you were raising your hand no yeah um i agree with uh, someone who was just saying that we need to be assertive and all my only point is that we want to understand china the way we want to understand without understanding china actually we really don't understand it's not like sushant sarin who can speak punjabi and say tu 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 si tu si with the Punj with the pakistanis we try to deal with effectively with pakistanis we can understand the americans we can understand the brits we can even understand the african and the arabs but to understand china is not easy mind you i come from a border area and i find it very very strange for people in new delhi to talk something without understanding lot of things i am not trying to be negative but the fact is that's why chinese have a sense 
that we really do not understand. And yesterday one of the editorials says, or perhaps the official said, that the Indian government is, or Indian t uh, channels are misleading their own people. Means that we are all talking these things in the realm of speculation. We are trying to correlate here and there and this and like that. But we really don't know on the ground. Your ME is not saying anything. Ministry of Defense is not saying anything. They're just mum on this. I mean, we are just going by uh, the, the Chinese statement. They're like this. They have been always like this, as somebody just said. Throughout history, you know, there is a book by Alan Whiting, a book called China Crosses the Yellow in the context of Vietnam. It yeah. says China is not likely to use the strategy of boxing. It uses the ants bite. You know, they will make like a, you know, ants biting one piece here, there, there, there. And finally, if that does not happen, then they might, might, might turn to the blow. So it is highly unlikely. I don't see. It's an interesting thing now to be seen tomorrow. Surely if there are no bilateral meetings on the sidelines, we need to see the body language. Yeah. Is there going to be a mutual snub? Are there going to be a back channel thing which perhaps they don't want to reveal to the media? Or maybe our journalist sitting in Beijing doesn't know? Uh, anything is possible. So l let's be hopeful, let's be optimistic, let's not talk about war what and all this aggression. It's not going to help us. What we do know is that tomorrow in Hamburg, and I'll, I'll come to Sushant Sareen in just one second. Uh, uh, tomorrow in Hamburg, uh, when the G20 kicks off, there is a meeting separately on the sidelines of the G20 where BRICS leaders will meet. That's the leaders of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Uh, it's expected to be about half an hour, a very customary thing that they usually do on the sidelines of other multilaterals, whereby m most of these leaders will simply read from a prepared text. There's going to be a photo opportunity at the end of it. Uh, presumably, they will shake hands. But Ambassador Stobdan is right. Uh, it'll be interesting to see the body language, Sushant Sareen, whether or not there will be a handshake. Uh, we've had an overdose of handshakes and embraces over the last three days between Mr. Modi and, and uh, Mr. Netanyahu. But, but really, I, I think tomorrow's meeting is going to be extremely critical. If, it, if one does indeed happen, even if it's a pull aside for five minutes, it gives out the signal that the two leaders are trying to resolve the situation. If on the contrary, there's cold body language between Narendra Modi and Xi Jinping, that just further, I guess, emboldens the Chinese. Sushan. No, it doesn't embolden the Chinese. I think as far as the Chinese are concerned, uh, they, uh, in fact, their people in the uh, embassy have been uh, letting it be known that there will be no handshake, there will be no photo op, there will be nothing of the sort. And heavens are not going to fall if there is no such thing. Uh, you know, this is the same kind of language the Chinese used uh, when they were organizing the Belt and Road Initiative and India did not participate. And India had very good economic and strategic reasons not to participate. Let's not make the Chinese out into 10 feet tall and let's not bestow all the wisdom of the world on them just because they are, are probably are not as articulate as, uh, as us in English and because of the Chinese system, political system, where there is no concept of speaking freely and honestly, uh, even within themselves, uh, they speak in riddles. Let's not try and attribute, you know, great wisdom to them. Now, let's come down to the brass tacks. Uh, what is the situation as far as we are concerned? Uh, the Chinese, for all the rhetoric they are doing, how do you think it... It, it appears to the rest of the world uh, with the kind of hysterical hysterics that the Chinese foreign office is indulging in. Here were these guys who would speak in measured tones, coolly, calmly, and here are these fellows who are getting hysterical, while the Indians in one or two statements have said in very measured and very balanced tones uh, what their position is. I don't think we need to do this grandstanding at this point in time. Okay. And as for resolve, uh, I think the forces on the ground are showing the resolve. Uh, the fact that Ultimately, the Indian uh, armed forces are, 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 are showing a level of self-assuredness and confidence should be good enough for us. Ultimately, rather than, you know, I think it's going to, in, if it's going to get and, resolved... And, 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 Zaka, let me just say one thing. Quickly, Zaka, quickly, Zaka, yeah, let quickly, me just say quickly, one thing. Quickly, yeah. The Pakistanis seem to be more influenced by the kind of badak which the Pakistanis give uh, than by their own uh, so-called, you know, uh, Mandarin kind of culture. So let's, let us, uh, we are not interested in a conflict but we are also, it is not in our interest to also back down in the face of uh, transgressions by China and provocation by China. Okay. And let us hope that uh, after this grandstanding is over, there will be some diplomacy which will help to diffuse the I, I, I said at the, right at the top of the show uh, that the only comparable example that we have from recent times is what happened in 86, the Samudrong uh, Chu uh, incident. It was called Operation Falcon. And maybe 
uh, uh, maybe in 30 seconds to a minute, uh, General Jaswal, if you can if you can tell us if that is the operational template to play by. We all remember the famous images of General Sundarji flying those two choppers. I think there were two brigades full of men uh, who, who virtually were locked in an eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball confrontation with the Chinese. It lasted for months. Uh, eventually, though, it paved the way for what was a very successful visit by Rajiv Gandhi, the then Prime Minister, to China in December, the first time that an Indian Prime Minister went to Beijing in 30 years or so. Uh, is that the template? Is that is that the way to operate and try and defuse Dokola? Be prepared for the long haul, and eventually it's only in the long haul that this will get resolved. No one can predict what China will do. The day China decides, uh, I can tell you, the question of full-fledged war is not there. They are hidebound by what Sun Tzu always keeps saying, you know, winning all without fighting, make the enemy smile while you hold a dagger behind your cloak and when he's disarmed, stab him. Now, the Chinese have always got the option to carry out posturing, nibbling actions, capture certain disputed areas and just do that, that's all. Now, you can imagine in Ladakh, 646 kilometers, there is transgression, there is a zone where we don't deploy, we also go and, you know, patrol in that area. Suddenly one day they come and decide and dig in there. Then, what do we do? Okay. Are we going to put in an attack to counter him? Incidentally, in 86, a mm. uh, battalion was there, though unfortunately I was not in the battalion. We were there in that area, T. Gompa, and uh, in a way we were postured against them. So, I, I know the whole story for that. But the Chinese always retain an option where they will create a situation and create a decision dilemma in the mind of the opponent. So he can go in. Let me now tell you that we should not take it too lightly All right. because he always carries out internal intensity and external calm. And that is the reason he's got roads up to all insertion points, including over here, up to St. Chenla. And Bergula, uh, Bergula, the road goes back from there. So he's got everywhere. Dolom Plateau is very important for him. So, so you know, similarly, I'm, I'm, all other places. I'm, I'm so he can come and suddenly sit down somewhere. I'm, go I'm going to, I'm going to wrap up because I'm, I'm completely run out of time. Uh, this is famous saying in China that that it, you have to be like a duck on water. On the surface, appear all calm and and, and smooth and, and smiling, even in reference to what one of the panelists said earlier. But underneath, you're actually paddling for your life. Uh, something similar is happening on on the Doklam Plateau while. On the surface, it seems like it's all calm and, and the exterior is fine. I think this is something that's going to be in the headlines for sure for the next weeks and months. And the only way India can resolve this is in the long haul. Uh, we've got to double down and we've got to face this up for the next few weeks and months. This story is not going away from the, from the headlines. This face-off is not, is not uh, getting resolved anytime soon. I want to thank all my panelists for joining us on our Talking Point. As we take a break, we'll have the results of our Twitter poll on this debate. Quick break, when we come back on the other side, we'll have another exclusive story that was exposed here on CNN News 18 earlier today about how Class A drugs are being made available to school students in Telangana. And now the state government has cracked the whip. Details when we return. After CNN News 18 exposed a drug peddling racket in Hyderabad in a major impact, now the Telangana Human Rights Commission has stepped in and issued notices to the local education, medical and family welfare authorities demanding an explanation as to how this menace went under the radar for so long. Eight drug peddlers have been arrested for supplying hardcore drugs like LSD and MDMA to students. Take a look at uh, the CNN News 18 expose that forced the authorities in Telangana state to act. School children high on drugs, peddlers supplying high-end narcotics to schools, school drug peddling racket busted in Telangana. Eight people have been arrested in Hyderabad for supplying drugs, especially LSD. 
Investigations revealed that the high-profile client list of the drug racket included school-going kids, some as young as those studying in class 8 and 9. It's a matter of concern because uh, um, LSD is normally used by people who are passing through a bad phase or, or it's, it's called a dark drug. If you, if you go and search on the net, it's called something called a dark drug or, or a dark zen. So uh, youngsters using it, especially a few school-going kids, it's a matter of concern. The good part is uh, uh, I can say with some amount of conviction that we wiped it out. Those on the client list of the drug racket also include college students, names from the entertainment industry and youngsters working in MNCs and the hospitality industry. Officials have seized 800 units of LSD, worth almost 80 lakh rupees. LSD or lysergic acid, dithylamide, is popularly sold at rave parties and is known to be a mood-changing chemical. It's actually come as a big shocker to all the parents in the city of Hyderabad. The kind of pocket money that we parents are giving access to. A kid having 3,000 rupees to buy drugs at the age of around 13 or 14, does it make any sense? There is 80 to 90 percent of problem even from the parents in such cases. It needs to be counseled from time to time. Those who are into the drug trade, those who are into making easy money, they are targeting the children because the children, those who are coming to this uh, corporate schools or these international schools, they are uh, from the moneyed class. They can easily sell their money, sell all their money. So uh, taking this weakness of the children, we, they, taking advantage of uh, stress, these people are making money out of uh, children. After the shocking revelation about school kids being on drug suppliers list, the excise department has now issued an advisory to 26 schools and 27 colleges. The Telangana government has also planned a meeting with principals of about 80 schools in Hyderabad on 14th of July. An extensive drug awareness program and a toll-free number has also been launched. The advisory basically look, mentions uh, the kind of uh, um, symptoms to watch out for or a particular age group or a particular group of youngsters to look out for. Drug addiction in school students is an alarming trend. While the drug bust has led to the peddlers being nabbed, none of the consumers have been arrested. With Sakshi Khanna in Hyderabad, Meghna Deka, CNN News 18. And in case you want to see that full story and the action taken by the Telangana government, you can go to our website. It's news18.com. From me, Zakar Jacob, and the rest of the team, thanks for your time. On the other side, Viewpoint with Bhupin Shabir.